as you already know, this is an introductory video for our capstone project, but this video also doubles as a demonstration for how I plan to construct the project. The format I'm using here is reflective of the format I use in my own web show, 3AM Soliloquies, where I combine gameplay, images, music, research, and live presentation segments like this one to discuss various aspects of fandom culture, but especially video games. That said, this project aims more specifically to examine the function of music in a handful of disaster video games, or more broadly, to connect the extensive work that's been done in ludomusicology on a specific case-by-case -case basis with the philosophical issues and real-world situations presented in a handful of select video games. Now, there's six very specific games we're going to take a look at for that purpose. But first, let's talk more about the rationale of the project itself. First of all, why video games? Why this medium that, for many years, was thought of strictly as, and may well have been, merely a fun and diversionary time waster? Well, like comics and movies and other forms of pop entertainment before it, the video game industry has evolved to deal regularly and deeply with real-world issues. Over other media, though, video games have the unique advantage of sitting at the intersection of visual, textual, tactile, and, most importantly to our purposes, musical stimuli. As opposed to other media that explore fiction or fantastic situations and worlds, video games allow the user immersion into fantastic situations, rather than simply passive observation as one might experience in a movie or book. For this reason, I like to discuss games in this format, because it allows for the viewer to get vital information about the game that they wouldn't have any reference for in a paper. For example, let's say I wanted to discuss the controls at a certain part, since part of what makes games so unique is that immersion and direct interface into their world. It's easy to do this and juxtapose video of the control against the gameplay. Let's say I want to analyze the music at a certain part, like for instance Death Stranding's establishment of its main motif at the start of the game. I can fade out the words, fade in the music, and present a reduction of the in-game music, like so. This way, the viewer is being presented not only with a score, but with the relevant gameplay and music too. For video games as a medium, it's much easier and more fulfilling to discuss them in video format. And, as we've seen already in this video, it's very easy to present graphics and definitions on screen for the convenience of either reading right then or pausing and reading. As a research-based medium, videos work well too. In the first episode of 3AM Soliloquies, which was largely based on a paper I wrote for a grad studies class about the indie game Shovel Knight, I cited many of the people and articles I wrote about in the paper and was able to do so with imagery and brief resumes. And then of course, during the credits crawl, it's very easy to put a list of works cited. As the primary sources for many of the projects I find myself working on are, in fact, video games, I often make asides during videos. These offhand mentions of other games are done to present supporting arguments, the same way you might cite other books or articles to back up your point in a paper. In using the web show format, I don't have to try and describe aesthetic or thematic elements of a game in order to set the stage, like I might have to if I was just writing about them. Instead, I can show it, and split-screen capabilities can, and have, allowed for interesting comparisons in previous videos. But now that we've discussed the significance of video games as a medium for examining real-world issues, and the use of the web show format as an effective way to talk about them, we're going to talk a little bit more about the project itself. That is, the structuring of the project, the conceptual flow it's going to follow, and the six primary games that we're going to be looking at. The final project will consist of a single video that will encompass two of the six games and will be used as a demo for an entire proposed video series. Each of the six games was chosen very carefully for dealing with the philosophy and psychology of musical response to disaster in a different way, and I aim to pair the games in such a way that they complement one another. In practice, it's best to give a brief explanation of the basic game premise, just for context, before jumping into analysis and examination of the soundtrack. Then, we'll explore the real-world roots of the music used in the game, and how these origins relate to the scoring decisions made for the game's thematic material. Finally, we'll take the information and bridge the gap between the soundtrack's function in-game and the soundscape's real-world roots through discussing how the gameplay and music create an experience that forces the user to confront whatever aspects of the human musical response to disaster it is that the game depicts. I'll give you an extremely abbreviated demonstration using Doom Eternal, one of the two games I'm using in the first video. And just to warn you, the game is extremely gory, 
So if that bothers you, beware ahead. The plot of the game basically depicts the biblical apocalypse, where the portal that some unwary scientists opened on Mars, then abused for the power of hell as a solution to the energy crisis, is instead used by the demons as a doorway to Earth, where they promptly begin devouring the world as you find out they've done to other worlds through multiple realities. You play as the Doom Slayer, a mortal turned brutal Avenger who's been fighting the demons across many continuities in his quest to repel them from the Earth one bloody carcass at a time. If this plot sounds ridiculous, it's because it is, and it approaches its material with the same juxtaposition of badassery and tongue-in-cheek satanic revelry that characterizes a lot of the music that inspired its aesthetic. Welcome, Slayer. Is my time at an end? Let's see if you're strong enough to survive this cursed season. When we listen to the soundtrack, a lot of it stems from ominous and terrifying chants in ancient languages, or, as the most prevalent style, blisteringly intense metal. As we've talked about in class, and as I'll talk about more in the video, extreme metal has its origins first in punk, which began as a socially conscious musical meditation of the ills of society, before spinning off into various forms of metal, which celebrated and fantasized about all forms of death, destruction, and carnage. Appropriately, this music is used all throughout Doom to be complementary of the many aspects of the game's design. For one, the game is characterized by extremely intense push-forward combat, where your whole goal is to clear a room as quickly and violently as possible. If you stop moving, you're dead, and the music reflects that intensity, as well as the brutal enjoyment that the Doom Slayer, and indeed you as the player, take in ripping and tearing through the hordes of hell, as well as the imagery and landscaping many of which could serve as a death metal album cover. It's also worth noting that the literal visual designs of many monsters are that of twisted, scarred flesh combined with metal, a design consistency that's been there since the very earliest days of the franchise. Examining all this, it's easy to see that Doom as a franchise was certainly inspired by the atmosphere and darkness of the extreme metal scene, but we can also see that the heightened intensity of the new game further lent the composer, Mick Gordon, to push the envelope with new approaches like his Hell Choir. In this way, this game was born out of a certain type of music, but would then retroactively inspire new approaches to it. The first video, the final project itself, will focus on two games, Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding, which relates directly to contemporary themes of isolation, death, and the importance of interpersonal connection in a deeply flawed world, as well as man-made disasters of all kinds, and Doom Eternal, which we just talked about. Beyond this first video, the other main games are The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask, for psychological aspects of depression, destruction, and existentialism, i.e. processing one's own imminent end, Final Fantasy VII Remake, for its portrayal of the pitfalls of human and corporate greed and environmental destruction, following characters on both sides of the issue, Final Fantasy X, for its complex and fantastical depiction of the intersection between religion, music, and natural disaster, and The Last of Us, which confronts the psychology of human survival in desperate situations, in this case, a very terrifying, very real zombie apocalypse, and the idea of humanity being the real monsters of any story set in our world. I really look forward to putting these videos out, not just because I love making videos about gaming, but because I feel that game music is a sorely underrepresented area in most legitimate academia. And just to drive that point home, take a look. I am holding the entirety of our library's resources on game music in my one hand. Video games are a consistently disrespected and disregarded artistic medium, and a lot of people consider them to be juvenile even now. But like I mentioned, a lot of our pop art started off the same way. And like that media, video games have evolved. One day, I hope to contribute a bit more about how we think about music and video games, because it's a truly important part of a truly unique medium. Thanks for listening.